sunny day here in Wisconsin. It's great. Uh, I'm Tim Moore from the Center for the Study of the American Constitution at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. My colleagues are? Uh, I'm Joe Stewart. I teach in the Political Science Department at Clemson University in South Carolina. And I'm Jack Barlow. I teach at Juniata College in Pennsylvania, where it is raining. <laughs> and you are? Hi, my name is Alex Browning. My name is Lida Wallman. My name is Emily Frame. Christopher Walker um, and our coaches, Mr. Samuel Schneider. How does it uh, how does it work out having your last name the same as, as the school? Um, it's interesting. It's okay. it's interesting. I would imagine. I would imagine. <laughs> Uh, well, it's unit two and it's question one, which is, uh, I think, of no surprise to anyone. I'll read the question and then we'll get ready to, and we'll go jump right in. Uh, the states sent delegates to the Philadelphia Convention to join with other states in, quote, devising and discussing all such alterations and further provisions as may be necessary to render the federal constitution adequate to the exigencies of the union. To what extent, if any, did the delegates follow their instructions? What experiences of state governments under the new constitutions after independence might have influenced the creation of the constitution? Do decisions of the Supreme Court US function as continuing constitutional convention? Why or why not, you may begin. Following the Annapolis Convention in 1786, state legislatures began passing bills to send delegates to the newly scheduled Philadelphia Convention. Virginia passed their act authorizing the election of delegates first in November of 1786. The act provided for the election of delegates by the state legislature to represent Virginia at the convention and instructed them to discuss all provisions necessary to render the federal constitution adequate to the exigencies of the union. This vague language, which most states duplicated in their own acts, enabled ambitious delegates like Madison to consider options ranging from minor edits of the articles to a complete rewrite. The states never clarified how extensive those provisions necessary might be, though. This led to the departure of some delegates, like Robert Yates and John Lansing, when they believed that the convention had exceeded its mandate. Each act passed by a state legislature did contain one basic rule. The states included clauses that explicitly and implicitly instructed delegates to return to their states after the convention to discuss the suggested changes. State instructions implied a process of consideration that would take place through existing state and federal governments. In the view of the state legislatures that sent them, delegates of the convention disobeyed the spirit of their limited mandate and crafted a radical new plan of government, bypassing state legislatures by bringing it directly to the Articles Congress and the people. The Constitutional Convention's extra-legal acts were then, however, legitimized by popular state ratification. This process paralleled that of state constitution making, whose results served as case studies for the framers. For example, Massachusetts's constitution leaned heavily on a strengthened executive, the advantages of which were made clearer during Shays' rebellion. The Virginia Constitution's Declaration of Rights also influenced the Constitutional Convention, demonstrating the value of the constitutional protection of religious freedoms for minorities. These same protections became a point of contention at the convention and during ratification, ultimately becoming a central part of the Constitution within the Bill of Rights. The convention also drew lessons from the highly democratic Pennsylvania Constitution of 1776. Its unicameral legislature and weak executive lacked power to enforce consistent laws fostering unrest. The framers would avoid such ultra-democratic traits in their final product. In all, state constitutions had proven inadequate to handle interstate affairs. Just as the constitution created by the delegates at Philadelphia reflected the constitutional experiences of the states, our modern constitution changes to reflect new influences and experiences. Today, the Supreme Court, functioning as a continuing convention, makes these changes, but without the popular legitimacy of a true convention. Demonstrating the influence of the court, Justice William Brennan would quiz young law clerks on how new constitutional law is made. After they struggled to recall Article 5, Brennan would hold up five fingers, representing five votes on the Supreme Court. Supreme Court decisions have had a profound effect on the application of the Constitution. From the early inception of judicial review in Marbury v. Madison to the protection of same-sex marriage in 2015 by Obergefell v. Hodges. 
Supreme Court decisions are based on text and precedent. As the composition of the court changes, precedents are overturned. In West Coast Hotel v. Parrish in 1937, the Supreme Court reversed its Lochner decision of 1905, prohibiting minimum wage under the contract clause to protect workers' health and safety. The fluidity of court decisions over time and the impact of changing ideologies makes the court a suspect actor for legitimate constitutional changes. Constitutional amendments pursued through Article 5, on the other hand, demand near impossible levels of popular support. An actual convention requires a democratic process that relies on the will of the public, not that of a select few. The Supreme Court, purposefully isolated from the people, was never intended to generate the same change as an amendment, yet it has become our primary driver of constitutional change and adaptation. Thank you. Um, let's let's uh, fast forward a little bit. The Anti-Federalists had a lot of criticisms, but they also had some criticisms about the convention itself and put their criticisms of the Constitution aside for a second. What were their, some of those criticisms of the convention and which do you think resonate most in your mind? The Constitutional Convention included um, a secrecy rule so that allowed the delegates to make any changes they wanted to the Constitution and debate them without the will of the public influencing any of that. And the Anti-Federalists greatly disliked this because they believed that the um, Constitution had no say with the people. But ultimately, that was not true because the ratification debates and ratification in the states eventually had the will of the people deciding if the Constitution should be passed or not. I think as Emily was saying, another complaint was that the convention was a collection of elites trying to modernize society or create a more urban environment for the country. Um, and to an extent that was true. You had an start um, really strong anti-federalists like Patrick Henry who were not in attendance because they feared the changes that would be made. So ultimately the final product um, really trended towards nationalist ideas. If you were an anti-federalist, would you have found it easy or hard to critique the convention if Washington and Franklin are there? It was, it was in fact, really difficult for the anti-federalists to stage um, real critiques of the people that were um, creating this constitution because they had such national renown and were so widely respected, which was one of the reasons why the nationalists had so much power um, at the constitutional convention and why the constitution was, was eventually passed by all the state um, uh, ratification conventions. Thank you. Especially at the ra okay. okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, at the ratification debates too, the Federalists usually had the um, the more educated people on their side. So it was um, more like farmers and um, backcountry people who were the anti-Federalists. So they didn't have the rhetorical power that the Federalists did in the ratification debate. So it was easier for the Federalists to get a pass. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a good transition to what I wanted to ask about. Was, was the ratification a foregone conclusion? Could you expand on, on that fight uh, some more? Um, it was not a foregone conclusion. One of the first places where they had um, a ratifying convention was in Pennsylvania, and they tried to um, get the convention um, done really quickly because they feared that with more debate over the Constitution, then it would be more likely to be rejected. So they tried to get it pushed through and didn't really um, want debate over it. And this is you said that that uh, legitimized them. Sounds like they used a process that may not have promoted legitimacy. It's certainly true that they were, um, they, they used techniques that might have affected the legitimacy. However, given that the people were ultimately um, in control of the fate of the constitution, and by and large, they approved of the constitution and the changes required. And given the um, significant support for the constitution since then, that, that's really where the legitimacy has come from. Okay, so you talked about the Constitutional Convention as, as coming up with a sort of an extra legal uh, document, right, when they came up with the Constitution that was legitimized by, by ratification. I'm just wondering, is it ever possible to do a sort of an intra-legal uh, uh, job of creating a new Constitution? Can you do that within the law? I think Virginia supplies a good example of that. Virginia's had seven different constitutions throughout its history, um, all through within the system of the state. 
And I think the amendment process supplies um, a mode of altering the Constitution, even if that alteration is um, so complete that it would mean a re complete rewrite. In the case of the um, Constitutional Convention in 1787, though, it wasn't possible because the Articles um, of Confederation required unanimous approval um, by all the states for any changes. So they felt that it wasn't possible to make any changes at all to the article. So they had to go through this route. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts about that? Mm -hmm. um, Look, okay. I, I, how representative do you think these uh, these cats were in Philadelphia? Um, I would take the position that they were not as representative as we tend to believe. Um, figures like Alexander Hamilton and James Madison were pursuing a vision of a new national country, um, whereas large amounts of people like those that were mentioned in Shays Rebellion and those um, on the Western frontier who were really enraged by events um, like the possible Jay Gardochi Treaty um, were a much larger portion of the, of the country. Beard made the argument that it was because of their lack of um, diversity in, the, in their really small representation that the founders created the constitution that they did. And while I don't think Beard's um, arguments necessarily stand up, it's certainly true that the founders of the constitution did not really um, supply a diverse view of um, backgrounds and histories. Mm -hmm. Do you think their ambition makes them suspect? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this, this was, uh, I, I think Joe has mentioned in the past, his, his, his primary standard before he gets all the details is, do I want to talk more? And, and I, I would share in that, uh, that sentiment. I think your opening statement was, uh, was thorough. I, I especially like the mention of uh, Yates and Lansing abandoning mid uh, midstream uh, because they feared the agenda switch. Um, I also think your, uh, your, 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 your analysis of the court and the, is it a convention or not was uh, particularly sophisticated. I enjoyed that. Um, in the follow-ups, I think you demonstrated clearly um, uh, a pretty deep understanding of all of the questions that we have. And, um, and especially, you know, hey, Jay Gardoki uh, as a factor in the, in the 1780s, uh, I, I especially appreciated that, and you used it well uh, in terms of this regionalization of, of, of opinion about the Constitution. I would ca uh, put a small caveat here. Be careful with a strict coastal and frontier analysis of Federalist, Anti-Federalist. There's some, um, some interior folks were pro-Constitution. I mean, Georgia, they, they, they wanted the Constitution because they were scared to death of it. Uh, they wanted federal help with Na uh, Native Americans. So uh, there are some states where it's not a clean coastal and interior analysis. So I would, I would caution you about that a little bit. But on the whole, this was a very uh, sophisticated analysis. And thank you. Yeah, I agree that the term sophisticated is, is one that's very appropriate. And uh, so I, I can talk about the things I wish we had had more time uh, to talk about. You, you talked about the departure of the, the opposition delegates. Um, one of the amazing things there is, of course, they, they don't go out and mobilize. They, they kind of keep, keep their counsel about the mm -hmm. spirit of, of the uh, rules that have been, been uh, set up, even if everybody was dissipating the spirit of what had gone on before. Uh, Wish we'd had some more time to talk about the legitimacy issues because when we talk about the Supreme Court and its level of legitimacy, it it ties in with your argument. You refer to the court as the primary driver of constitutional change. Well, what are the possible or what are the secondary and tertiary drivers, and what about the legitimacy of of those groups? Do we rely purely on what you accurately describe 
as a difficult process for formally amending the Constitution, although not as difficult as we had under the, uh, under the article. 